Okay, we'll get started. So hello everybody, my name is Jay. I'm one of the expert OET teachers here at E2 Language. Today we're going to do uh, an OET speaking workshop. Really, we're going to look at the most important aspect of speaking, which is the scoring criteria, which is what the examiners use when they're marking your speaking. So everything you do has to be aimed at that criteria, okay? It doesn't matter if you're an a native English speaker, if you're not speaking in a certain, if you're not, not speaking in a certain way, that's the wrong way to look at it. If you're not um, communicating in a specific way, according to the criteria, then you, you will lose points. Um, conversely, if you do communicate according to this criteria, you'll get a high score. Of course, there is two elements that you'll be scored on, linguistic skills and communicative skills, but we'll look at that. Actually, let's look at that now. So the way that you're scored in OET speaking is on language skills and clinical skills, right? Language skills is, is pretty straightforward. Four things, intelligibility, fluency, appropriateness, and grammar and expression. What we mean here is with intelligibility, that refers to how clearly you can say all of the sounds in English. That is, there are 44 sounds in English. 44 consonants and vowel sounds. How clearly can you articulate each of those? Then you have consonant clusters. So it's not just k, uh, d, f, for example, but fl or dr or cr. So these are consonant clusters when you've got two or more consonants that come together. So that's intelligibility, really the clarity of your speech. Fluency Yes, it refers to the speed at which you speak and you should be speaking at a moderate tempo, not too quickly, not too slowly. But it also includes things like fillers going, ah, uh, um, ah, uh. if you have too many of those, that's a problem. It also includes hesitations or searching for language. If you stop because you can't think of that particular word or that particular phrase, then that's a particular problem. Appropriateness, C, that refers to your level of politeness and formality, your, the absence of jargon. Um, and you've got to think about you're in a medical context there. And then finally, you've got grammar. That refers to two things, the variety of grammar. So you can use a lot of different grammar to express different types of meanings at different times. That is, you can use verb tenses appropriately um, modal verbs when you need to, um, you know, just the, 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 those, that's grammatical variety. Then you've got grammatical accuracy. That means that the verb tense is correct, that you're saying he goes, not he go. Um, you know, plural nouns, putting an S, headache versus headaches, for example. And then you've got expression. That is the particular phrases or how natural your language is. So this is the language criteria, okay? And each of these are very important. They're all scored out of six points. Okay, so you get six points. Uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, or six points for each of these. But you're also scored on clinical skills. And I want to get, run through this again with you because this is, as I mentioned, ultimately how you're scored. Okay. And why this is challenging is because there's a lot to remember here with clinical skills. I've been giving a lot of um, speaking mock tests over the last couple of weeks, which has been really interesting. And even very high scoring doctors, for example, who might even be native speakers, still don't do or don't include particular aspects of clinical skills. And as such, their score is reduced. Okay. So we really need to be mindful of how you're scored according to clinical skills. You can't really do much about your language skills you know, a few weeks before your test, okay? Your language skills are, you know, grammar, vocabulary, that stuff takes a long time to fix or improve. But you can rapidly uh, improve your clinical skill communication, okay? That includes, there are, there are five uh, major criteria here, relationship building, patient's perspective, providing structure, information gathering, and information giving. Each of these has sub-criteria. And each of these uh, is scored out of three. So they're less important. Sorry, they're less, they're less, what's the word? They're not scored as highly. They're scored uh, 
lower than the language skills. However, there is more of them. So in a way, it's just as important, if not more important. Let's start with the first one, which is relationship building. Um, so we're looking at this one here. That refers your ability to start the conversation, be attentive, be non-judgmental, and show empathy. So let's go through each of these. Because it's up to you, as the medical professional in this role play, to initiate, start the conversation, and keep the conversation going, and end the conversation as well. It's your job, not me as the patient. Okay, it's not my job to say, hello, doctor. It's up to you to say, hello, Jay. Nice to see you again, etc. cetera. Um, I had a speaking mock test the other day with a doctor and she just simply did not start the conversation. And so I sat there quietly. She looked at me. I looked at her. She would have uh, lost a lot of points for that. She needs to walk into that ward or the, or the, 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 the surgery or whatever and say, hello, I'm Dr. Blah, blah, blah. So here's an example. She'd say, hi, Mrs. She's talking to me. She'd say, hi, Jay. My name is, I'll reverse it. Hi, Mrs. Smith. My name is Dr. Jay. Thanks for coming to see me. Now, I understand that you are having some issues with your medications. Is that right? This is a good little introduction. You could even say, how are you feeling? And then move into the scenario of the role play, the, the context of the role play. How you introduce yourself uh, really comes from that first section of the role play there, the background information. For example, let's say it says something like, you are providing test results to a patient after he had experienced blah, 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 blah. So you would walk in because you know this patient, you can assume you do. You'd say, hello, Mr. Smith, how you been feeling? You'd say, oh, I'm not feeling too good. You say, okay, that's, that's unfortunate to hear. Now, I've got your test results here. Do you mind if I talk to you about those? Okay, so you're bringing that scenario. You also have to be attentive. Okay, this is critical because uh, what's happening here is you're gonna have the role play card, okay? And you're gonna be concentrating on speaking and reading and making sure you're following this role play card. At the same time, you need to listen very carefully to that patient. And you need to respond very appropriately to that patient. In other words, you need to be very attentive. How do you be attentive? Well, you can do things like, do you mind if I ask you a few questions about your past medical history? Okay, so th there's this sort of permission getting. There's also a critical thing here, which we'll see later on. To be attentive also means when you're listening carefully, to be reflecting back what the patient said. So for example, if the doctor says, Jay, how long have you been having these headaches? And I say, well, you know, I guess, I guess they started about six months ago, but you know, they seem to be getting worse and I have them once a week. Now, how can you be attentive after the patient says that? What you can do is then say, okay, so they started about six months ago. Is that right? And I say, yes. And you said that they're now happening every week or, and they're getting worse. Is that right? Yes. So I'm confirming my understanding. I'm really listening and repeating back what the patient said in question form. It's a great way to be attentive. Uh, you should also be non-judgmental, okay? Um, even if you think the patient is doing something wrong, smoking cigarettes, um, taking too many of the, his prescription drugs, who knows what it is. Maybe you have a personal ethical or moral issue with that. Not on test day. You keep that quiet. It's about non-judgmentality, okay? So the doctor says, for example, I can understand that you might not want to stop taking your medication. I can see that. So I'm not being judgmental here. I'm uh, just being very polite, very polite. Showing empathy is an interesting one. Um, just like being attentive. In fact, if you're being very attentive, you're also being very empathetic at the same time. That is, the more you listen to the patient and reflect back what the patient said and say, and go, hmm, right, I see. Okay, so, so about six weeks, I see, yeah. Okay, that must be hard, right? Of course, you know, listening very carefully, that's showing really good use of empathy there. Empathy is not just saying, I'm sorry to hear that, or I can understand you might be feeling that way, or that must be terrible. That's an okay 
use of empathy, it's not going to get you a high score. In order to score highly here, you want to be attentive. So you could say, hmm, yes, I can see how stopping, talk, sorry, stopping taking the medication suddenly might be a bit scary. If you are going to say a phrase like, that must be difficult, please say, okay, yeah, that must be difficult stopping your medication so suddenly. Okay, so add in the reason why it's difficult. Don't just say, that must be hard. Say, yeah, I can see how that, that must be hard raising a child you know, by yourself, whatever it is. Okay, so give the reason why it's difficult, why it's hard, why it's terrible. Another really great, great way to show empathy is to use the patient's name. Okay, so as the doctor says, I understand, Jay, uh, or I understand that it must be difficult, Jay, you know, preparing for this exam and, and not getting enough sleep, whatever it is. So use the patient's name also. Um, any questions so far? Let's go back and we'll look at the, the list there. So let's look at the list, starting the conversation, being attentive, being non-judgmental and showing empathy. Any questions about this? Fung has a question, which is, I would like to ask if the scenario given that I need to give discharge advice for my patient, that means the patient has already known me. Can I just not introduce myself since it's a bit weird? That's right. You need to make a decision. When you look at your role play card and it has the, the scenario here, you need to make a decision whether you know the patient or not. If you know the patient, then you can say, hello, Jay, nice to see you again. How are you feeling? If you do not know the patient, you'll say, hello, Jay, my name is Dr. Smith. Um, I understand that, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't really matter, to be honest. You're not going to be penalized on that. If you're unsure, you can ask the interlocutor, the person you'll be speaking with on test day, during the preparation time. You have three minutes prep time to learn the role play. You can say, excuse me, uh, in this role play, have I met, do I know you or should I, do, I, do I introduce myself to you? And they will tell you, okay? So if you're unsure, ask them. Remember that the interlocutor, the person you're speaking to on test day is not actually doing the marking. They, they are not actually taking score. They're just performing. It's then sent to an examiner who will then actually be listening to the recording and doing the marking. Daniel, is it possible to take notes in order to plan the speech and remember key points like names, drugs, conditions? Um, you can't really plan the speech so much because you want to be attentive and you want to listen carefully and respond to the patient. You can't really plan it. I mean, there's a basic plan here with the tasks, right? So you know the sequence. And you know that the patient's role play card connects to this role play card where I have to, as the doctor find out, the patient has to explain where the patient has to complain. I have to reassure. So they're connecting to each other, the tasks. However, there are, there will be a couple of things in the patient's role play card that you'll be unaware of, and you need to respond to that. In saying that what I would do on role on test day, is with each of the tasks, there's a key verb, give, explain, agree, um, reassure. Excuse me, those key verbs I would underline because that's what you're ultimately doing in that task. Evan, would it be correct to ask the patient, how would you like me to address you? No, nope, yep, that's fine, you can do that. You can do that uh, during the role play. You can sort of say, hello, my name is Dr. Smith. I'm here to talk to you about your medications. Uh, what can I, what, or how, sh how should I address you? How should I address you? That's a nice way. Yep, or how would, I, how would you like me to address you? And they will just give you their name. They'll say, call me Sally, Mr. Smith, whatever. Abdul Hamid, what can I do if the person who's speaking with me is not cooperative and not giving answers to keep the conversation going? Well, I mean, Abdel, that means the person you've been practicing with is, is not doing the role play appropriately. Some of the stuff you see on YouTube, for example, is, is just inappropriate, incorrect, wrong, silly. 
the patient might be reluctant and you might have to persuade the patient and they might say a few things to show their reluctance, but ultimately the patient will then agree. Okay. And the reason the patient might be reluctant is because it's pushing you. It wants to push you to see if you can search for new language and new way to try and convince me of something, but they will always go along with you eventually. Okay. Uh, Anish, can you please suggest me some short phrases or words which I can use to keep the proctor aware that I'm remember they're not oh, sorry aware that I'm listening to what she's saying even though I'm looking at my role play card. For example, words like right, uh huh, ah, uh, okay, yeah. So in order to be attentive and to show empathy, you can use little words like mm hmm. They're not even words like mm hmm. Right, right. I see. Okay, okay, okay. That makes sense. Ah, right, I see. Yes, yes, uh -huh, I see. Things like this. This is a great way of being attentive and showing empathy. So yes, okay, I see, uh -huh, these sorts of words, of sounds. Carla, when the patient says that they are going to complain to a higher authority, how to handle that and what to say? I would say, that's fine, Mr. Smith. That's completely up to you. You can feel free to make a complaint. Um, between what to advise or tips can you give me if I'm not a spontaneous speaker? Well, I mean, between the good thing is really you're reacting to responding to the person on test day. So you're not really making, you'd be surprised how easily this story evolves. You've got the basic narrative here. You've got someone to bounce off ideas. Um, you'll find that you just are able to come up with ideas. Janet, I encountered one role play asking to outline the management plan. Does it mean summarize all what has been discussed? Um, we'll get to that actually, we'll get to that because there's a part where you need to explain something and we'll talk about that. Okay, so we talked about being attentive, talked about non-judgmentality, talked about showing empathy. Let's now shift to this section of the criteria which is incorporating the patient's perspective. Okay, what does that mean? It refers to your ability to explore the patient's concerns and ideas. Okay, you, especially at the beginning, you're really finding out what's wrong with the patient, not just medically wrong, but also socially, psychologically, what else is happening there? Because they might come to you with some irritation or some stomach upset, but there's oftentimes another element there that'll be of concern to the patient. You want to find out what, what the whole picture, okay, the whole picture. You also want to pick up on patient cues. We'll talk about that. And you want to relate your explanations to the patient's concerns. That is, you want to make it meaningful to the patient. So let's talk about exploring the patient's concerns and ideas. So I come in, I'm the patient, um, and I've got headaches, right? That's my medical issue. But at the same time, I've got to take an exam on Friday and I haven't been sleeping very well. So yes, I've got a medical issue, but you also need to explore how it's impacting my life and my social life and whatever's going on, my psychology. And so I'm going to sort of have two things going on. So um, for example, this doctor says, so Jay, am I right in assuming you're a little bit concerned about stopping your medication? Yes, I am. Okay, tell me a little bit more about that. Why, why does that concern you to stop your medication? And the doctor and the patient will, will go into a bit of a story. Okay, well, you know, if I stop my medication now, you know, I've got this event on next Thursday and I'm worried that I might get a bit anxious before the event. Oh, that's totally understandable. Well, perhaps we can look at ways in which you can reduce your whatever. Okay, make it meaningful to my situation circumstance. You also need to pick up on patient cues. What does this mean? Okay. So imagine you're talking to the patient, you're explaining something and the patient says, hmm, I don't know. Do you just continue on or do you stop and do you say, Jay, you actually don't seem too convinced about my explanation. Can I ask you why you're expressing, expressing that? Well, the reason is doctor, because blah, blah, blah. Or let's say, for example, 
I'm concerned about stopping my medication. Fine. You're just discussing that. And then I mentioned something like, yeah, you know, it makes me a bit anxious. Now, should you ignore what I've just said about anxiety and continue on talking about stopping the medication or should you stop and say, Jay, okay, so you mentioned, you've just mentioned something about being anxious. Can you tell me a bit more about that? That's what you have to do on test day, okay? Because there is a, there is a bit of scoring and if you don't pick up on that cue, you'll get a low mark there. If you do stop and say, tell me more about that, you will get a, a higher score. Now you need to relate your explanations to the patient's concerns to angle your explanation according to what I've been talking about. So here um, there's something I've been obviously concerned about dizziness and concern. And I've also been concerned about whatever, something else driving my car. So as the doctor or the nurse, I would say, okay, so Jay, there's certainly something we can do about your dizziness and with your regards, or with regard to your concerns about driving your car, I would like to also discuss that. Okay. So make it relevant to me. Any questions so far about that? Let's bring up the list. Any questions on these three here? Nope. As soon as I say nope and click next, somebody will type something into the chat. Nope. Okay. Yep, there it is. All right. Anish, what if I pick up all the cues and start elaborating on them and finally end up not finishing the tasks towards the end of the five minutes? There will usually be one cue or one hint that the interlocutor will put into his or her role play. So it's usually only one and all you need to do is stop and talk about it for 15 seconds and then continue on. Okay. Good question though. All right. Let's talk about this one. This one, um, two of these, two of these, <clears throat> nobody ever does. Okay. Or well, very few people do. So providing structure, this refers to your ability to sequence the interview make, whoops, make topic changes clear and organize your explanation. So sequencing the interview is pretty straightforward. Basically, you've got your tasks here, okay? Follow the tasks because they build a story and you, you, you know, the first task will be to find out what's troubling the patient. The second task will be to reassure that the patient, everything will be fine. The third task will be to explain why the patient needs to do this. Fourth task will be to whatever. And the patient's doing the same thing. Follow it. Don't just follow the sequence of the tasks. That's all. That's it. Follow the tasks sequentially. Okay. Sometimes you'll jump around a little bit. For example, um, you'll be finding out about symptoms, right? And you'll be, you'll be going, okay, so, so what sort of, can you tell me about the symptoms you've been experiencing? And the patient will say, well, you know, I've been having, I've been having headaches. Okay. Tell me more about these headaches, blah, 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 blah. And then the patient might say something. Yeah. You know, if a friend told me that to stop headaches, I should, um, whatever, eat yogurt. And there'll be something in the next task that'll be talking about why yogurt is not whatever. I'm just making this up. It's stupid, but you get my point. But then you might need to come back to that first task to find out because it might have something more about, there might be more from each task. So with each task, exhaust the information from that task, then move on to the next one, exhaust the information from that task, move on to the next one. Don't just go dot, 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 boom. I finished in one minute and 30 seconds. No, each task, if you've got five tasks, your role play goes for five minutes. You should be spending about a minute on each task. This one, no one ever does. So if you're about to take a speaking mock test with one of our expert teachers, please do this and they will be very happy because no one does this. Make topic changes clear. Now that we've discussed the symptoms, I'd like next to talk about possible causes. Does that sound okay? 
Yes. So what the doctor or nurse is doing here is they've got their first task. The first task is find out about symptoms. Okay, so you're spending a minute talking to the patient about symptoms, exploring all the, that information. Next task will be to um, find out about causes or talk to the patient about possible causes. So we wanna make that transition from task one to task two very clear and explicit. So I will say that, I'll say, okay, now that we've talked about the uh, symptoms of your migraines, um, next I would like to talk about the possible causes. Is that okay? And always just ask if that's okay to proceed. And the patient will say, yes. And that helps to structure the role play. Me as the interlocutor, I know, I know what's coming next. Me as the doctor, I know which task we're on. Make topic changes clear. Organize your explanations. So at some point during the role play, you're going to have to explain something like how to apply a, a, a lotion, um, some sort of course of medication or how to apply a bandage or what time they're supposed to pick up the whatever, something like there's some explanation. Don't do this. Okay. So what you need to do is you put the cream on your head and then you rub it on your forehead and then you might need to do this. And after that, you'll need to go after this and blah, 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 blah. No, organize your explanations by saying, okay, first thing you do, Jay, is you need to put a little bit of cream on your finger. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Then what you do is you smear it a little bit and you'll put it on the affected area. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. After you've done that, right, I'm just, Two things I'm doing. One is I'm stepping them through the explanation part by part. And at every step, I'm stopping to make sure that they've understood what I've said. That's the perfect way to do that. Any questions so far about um, these three? Sequencing the interview, making topic changes clear, and organizing explanations. Um, Abdul Hamid, do pauses affect the score? Pauses are a good thing in the right place. You actually need to pause when you're explaining something. Okay, you explain step one, you pause and say, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, let's talk about step two. Step two, you need to do this. So pausing, especially when explaining something is a good thing. Pausing when you're just, you've, you don't know what to say or you can't find the right grammar, that's a problem. Anish, I hope this won't happen to me or anyone, but what if the, the interlocutor shoots a bunch of questions at me? Like, is it curable? Is it contagious? Am I going to die? How should I react? Answering all of them one by one is never going to happen. That probably won't happen. These interlocutors are trained. But what you can do is say, uh, let's approach each of these questions one by one, if that's okay. What's your first concern? And the person will say, first of all, well, is this disease curable? Okay, let's talk about how, whether it's curable or not first. Then give your discussion there. What's your second concern there? Okay, so you can break it up. Okay, nice. I told you there was a lot to... It's not over yet. There's a lot to remember here, okay? Um, there's a lot to remember. It sort of all makes sense though. It's all really quite um, valuable information. I think the way that OET actually created this test and created this specific scoring, this criteria is from real clinical interactions, from best practice in clinical communication. And then they basically said, okay, what's the best way that doctors and patients and nurses and patients communicate, or doctors communicate to patients. Let's make a test around that and build the scoring so that they're actually doing it well. So you know, in a sense, this is really good professional development. Okay, let's talk about information gathering. This refers to your ability to minimize interruptions, to not interrupt the patient to ask open questions followed by closed questions. We'll talk about that. To avoid asking several questions at once. To clarify anything that 
is a bit vague that the patient said to make sure you stop and clarify. And as somebody asked before to summarize information. So first of all, minimizing interruption. This is easy. Don't interrupt the patient. Okay. And if two of you go to speak at the same time, make sure you say, no, no, please, please, you go ahead. Okay. Um, yes. Let the patient speak first. Now there's different ways to, that you can do this. Again, pausing is good. Letting the patient speak silence here and pausing is good. If the patient's still saying something and again, using verbal encouragement, such as, uh -huh, mm -hmm. ah, ah, I see, I see, right. Okay, okay, right. That's really good. Echoing and repetition. Chest pain. Okay, right. Okay, not coping. I see. Yeah, yeah. And then paraphrasing and interpretation, such as, okay, so you think you might not cope if you stop taking your medication. Is that right? Yes. So that all makes sense, right? Okay, very few OET candidates do this. And it's sort of what we talked about before with being attentive, listening very carefully, being empathetic. Here we're asking open questions followed by closed questions. What does that mean? Well, when you first ask a question about, say, um, medication use or symptoms or whatever, make it a very broad question. Say, tell, can you please tell me about your medication use? I'm going to get the patient to speak. Okay. The patient will then say, blah, 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 side effects. And then you say, okay, so you're experiencing side effects. That's a closed question that's going to elicit a yes, no answer. Yes, I am. Now, the reason this is good is you go open, close, open, close. The reason you do that is you're exploring the patient's concerns and then you're confirming your understanding and also showing empathy by reflecting back and saying, oh, okay, so, wow, you've been, okay, you've had this, this, these headaches for six months? Yes, I have. Okay, open, close, open, close. Remember that, that's a really good strategy. Avoid compound questions. What this means is asking more than one question at the same time. Don't do this. So you're worried about taking too much medication and the possible side effects? One question at a time. As soon as the examiner hears two questions at once, you lose a point. So you, yeah. Next one, clarify things. So if I'm the patient and I, and I say, this goes back to picking up on patient cues. It's very similar. So if I'm the patient and I say, yeah, look, I don't know about, I don't know about that. That's very unclear, clarified. Say, okay, so I'm, I'm what you might say, okay, sorry. So you're a bit nervous about that. Can you, actually, this isn't a good, this isn't a good example, but um, it's more like, it's more like picking up on the cues and saying, okay, you seem a little bit concerned about that. Can you please tell me what your concerns are? Okay, you seem, that's a nice way to put it. You seem a little bit concerned or, um, or I take it that you're not, you don't feel comfortable doing this. Is that right? Um, anyway, clarifying something that's unclear from the patient. Okay, make sure you got the story 100%. Summarizing. So what you need to do as the doctor, uh, you'll be doing this as you're doing open, close, open, close. But at some point you might say, okay, so, sorry, let me see if I've got this right. So you've been having, having the headaches for about six months and you haven't taken medication yet. And you're, you're hoping that medication will help you. Is that right? Yes. So I've done a nice little summary. Okay. Now that we've talked about that, let's, let's now talk about what we can do for you. Does that sound okay? Yes. So summarizing as, you, as you're going along. This sounds crazy that you have to do all this in five minutes, but um, there's, there is opportunity to do each of these. Any questions on minimizing interruption, open question followed by closed question, avoiding asking more than one question at a time, clarifying vague statements from the patient and summarizing information. Any, <clears throat> any questions?
I tell you what, if you do all of this, you'll be like the world's best communicator, clinical communicator, really. And it's so amazing. Even when I do these role plays, even though it's fake, right? It's fake. I don't have this problem and I know I'm performing. When I'm with a, when I'm with a doctor or a nurse who is actually doing this, like listening to me, reflecting back, echoing, going, mm -hmm, oh, I see, right. Okay. Oh, that must be tough. I mean, it's amazing as the patient. I'm like, wow, this person is so kind. Okay. So it's a really, really lovely skills to have anyway. Um, Himanshu. So summarizing means explaining all the info given by the patient back to him in a nutshell. Yes. Now at some points it might not be appropriate because the conversation is still going, but at some point you might just sort of go, okay, so let me see if I've got this right. You, f you want to do this, this, and then this. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I see. Okay. Let's, let's proceed on. But yes, that's right. Okay. Whoops. I'm in the wrong way. Ba, 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 ba. Clarifying. Okay. Here we are. Information giving. Um, all right. A couple of questions before I proceed. Uh, Nyozi, what if the patient continues to speak on an issue? That means the interlocutor is not very good at his or her job. So they are trained to participate in the conversation. Um, if they're speaking too much, then that's, um, that's a problem. Usually it's, usually it's a balance. Usually, usually the nurse or doctor speaks for about 60, 60% 60 of the time, I would say. And the patient's speaking for about 40% of the time. So it really is, you know, it's, it's, it's not just you talking. There's a lot of, if you're asking questions, which you should be, the patient will also be speaking quite a bit. Janet's question. On the role play card, it says outline the management plan as the last task. Yep. Okay. So if it says that, you would say, okay, Jay, now that we've talked about all of this, I want to talk to you about your management plan and how we're going to help you to overcome whatever it is that you're having. So the first thing in the management plan is to make sure that blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. In addition to that, I want you to blah, blah, blah. Is that, do you have any concerns about that? No. Okay, great. That's how you would do that. Dong Jim, do we need to summarize at the end? Well, not most of the time, no, because you'll run out of time. When it hits five minutes, the interlocutor will go, time's up. That's fine. That's, you haven't done anything wrong. So there'll be no time to do a summary at the end. If you feel that you have finished at about four minutes, like a little, like quite quickly, then you can do a verbal summary at the end and say, okay, I'd just like to briefly summarize what we've spoken about today, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. So you've come in, you've got, you've been having headaches for about six months. Uh, we talked about your symptoms. We also talked about possible medications that, that might help you. You also mentioned that you're a bit nervous. Um, is that what's, is that what we spoke about today? Yes. Okay. Do you have any, a good way to finish the role play is just to say, do you have any last questions or do you have any final questions? And if the interlocutor says, no, that's all say, so, okay, lovely to meet you. End of role play. Muhammad, what to do if the patient repeats his concern or questions? Yes. Good. Yes. Sometimes for the patient, the interlocutor, it will say, um, ask about something. And then in the next task, it will say insist. Okay. So let's say I'm the patient and I am convinced that I'm having a heart attack. Right. And I tell you, I said, listen, doctor, I think I may be having some sort of heart attack. And you as the doctor reassure me and say, no, in fact, it, it's not a heart attack. We've run the tests. It looks like it might be blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, okay. Now in the next task, it might say insist that you have had, you are having a heart attack. And I'll say, doctor, are you sure I'm really having all the signs and symptoms of a heart attack? So you might need to then go through it again with me very politely, maybe with a little bit stronger tone this time and say, Jay, look, we've looked at all the test results. 
there's really nothing to be concerned about. So you do have to sometimes use a tone of voice. You're still being very polite, but your tone of voice might shift a little bit and you are actually marked on tone. Cool. Information giving. So we've done information gathering. We've asked lots of open questions followed by closed questions and we found out about the patient's concerns, their medical issue, plus any other um, auxiliary concerns they have. Now we're going to be giving information to the patient. There's a certain way that we do that. This refers to your ability to establish what the patient knows, to pause when giving information, which we've talked about, to encourage the patient to share his or her thoughts, to check whether the patient has understood, and to ask what else you can do. So we've already sort of mentioned all of this, but let's go through it again. This one's kind of weird, to be honest, and I don't find this very applicable. Establish what the patient knows. So are you aware of the side effects of this medication? Um, have you heard about this disease before? It's just a single question that you'll put in just to, just to, um, Exactly. Establish what the patient already knows. Usually the patient will say, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. But you can pop these in as well. This, this, you are scored on this, but honestly, sometimes it just feels a little bit false. But see if you can pop it in, if it's appropriate. As we discussed, pause when giving information. So first you need to do this. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. After that, you should do this. Okay. Little pauses, great. Don't just go ba 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 Encourage the patient to share his thoughts. What do you think? Do you have any concerns? Is that clear? Do you mind if I proceed? These sorts of things, this is great. Because what will happen is the patient will have concerns. And if you're able to preempt the patient's concerns, okay, let's say you your task says, tell the patient that he should stop taking his medication. You say, Jay, listen, you've been on this medication for a long time. Um, we think it's probably best if you start to taper off. Do you have any concerns about that? Yes, I'm going to have concerns about that. And I'll say, yes, doctor, actually, I've got lots of concerns. So encourage, encourage the patient to share his thoughts or feelings about that. Check whether the patient has understood so is that clear, Mr. Smith? So how much medication should you take every morning? Um, this one, again, this one is written into the scoring, but feels a little bit patronizing. This, this is a weird one. Would I do this on test day? I don't know. Um, you'd have to do this very politely. Let's say you 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 explain something to the patient and or let's say you explain a med medication dosage to the patient okay what the oet scoring says is that the doctor or nurse should then ask the patient to repeat what you've just said so so that the patient so you know the patient's understood but it's very sort of like it's a bit weird to say so what did i just say you know that's a bit strange so how can we phrase this Actually, you, you try. How can you phrase that? I've just said, I'm the doctor. I've just told the patient that they should take four mil, 40 milligrams of this medication. How can I check that the patient has understood? What's a good way to do this? Pop it into the chat. Yeah. Okay, good. So Anish has said, are we clear? Or does that make sense? Or I think that's probably fine. Between says, can you re please repeat what I just said? And Janet's got a nice one. Nice one. Can you, can you please confirm that you understand that? That's a nice way to do it. Then you're not, it's not patronizing. You want to do it in a way that makes the patient comfortable. So can I just confirm that you understand how much medication you need to take? Yes. Or Abdul Hamid, could you please repeat the dose to me again? I think that's fine. Felix says, do you still remember the dosages I told you about? Um, it, it's a, honestly, this one's weird. It's just, I hate this one. It just feels so, I guess though, 
if, if you let's leave this one only if you're giving something very important to the patient. Okay. You don't want to do this throughout the role play because it's, it would just be inappropriate, but let's say there's something in there that's very important, like a dosage of a medication. That's really the only thing I could think of or when the patient should return for the checkup or something. Um, then you might want to get the patient to say, um, what did Janet say again? Can you just, can you please confirm to me that you understand how much medication you need to take? I think that's a nice, what you'd phrase it, you said, listen, this is a very important little piece and I just need to know that you understand how much medication to take. Yes, I do. Okay. So it's 40 milligrams, right? Yes, that's correct. Anyway, that's a weird one. Last one, ask what else you can do. Straightforward. Is there anything else I can help you with? Do you have any final questions? That's how you'll basically end the role play. Cool. So, holy moly, right? There's a lot of clinical skills. Meanwhile, you are using good grammatical structures, you're being grammatically accurate, using a wide range of vocabulary, using natural phrases, you're not speaking too quickly. Hopefully you're not umming and ahhing too much. You're allowed, of course, you can um and ah a little bit. That's completely natural. Um, what else? Your pronunciation is clear, um, etc. So, cool. Any questions there? Let's have a look. Himanshu, is it okay if I use the phrase all good instead of is that clear? All good is a little bit too informal. I sort of say all good to my friends. Jay, weird question. I love weird questions. Here we go. Can you see the clock ticking or just the interlocutor will just tell you it finished? Uh, I think it depends on the test venue, which is a bit stupid. Um, the answer is, um, the answer is no expect not to see a clock. So you don't, you have no idea when the five minutes is up. Um, so you need to get a bit of a feel for when five minutes is up. Dong Jim, do I need to paraphrase the task written on the card when doing a role play? Is it possible to read it? Um, you will, it's, it's a great question. So for example, let's say the task on the role play card says, um, find out how long the patient has been experiencing headaches. And you can say, so how long have you been experiencing these headaches for? So I've taken the main thing there and I've added a little bit to change the, the grammar and to, to, to change it a little bit. The, the short answer is it's fine to use the wording from the tasks. Naturally, you will change it a little bit and that's completely fine. And then you're going to have to respond with language that doesn't exist on the role play card at all. Anish, nine times out of 10, by the end of the five minutes, I'm still speaking and have one or two tasks left. If this happens on both of my role plays, is there a good chance of me not getting a B? Um, look, you really, you're probably spending too long in each task then for some reason. When the role play ends at five minutes, you should sort of be into the, f the final task, maybe the second last task. So maybe try to be a, not speak more quickly, but be a little bit more efficient at moving through the tasks, maybe asking a few, a few less questions, a less few questions, a few, a few, that's crazy grammar. Miriam, what if my interlocutor keeps telling me what to do, not giving me the chance to lead the communication? It won't happen. Hopefully it won't happen. You're the doctor. You take control. Liji, during emergency condition, is it good to ask the patient's name at first? Right. So you are marked on tone and appropriateness. If it's an emergency condition, yeah, you still need to ask the patient's name. Let's say, hello, my name is uh, Dr. Smith. Can I, what's your name? Jay. Okay, Jay. I understand you've, you've been having a heart palpitations. Is that right? Um, and then you might refer to your patient by their first name again and again in an emergency situation with, you know, urgency re might require that. Janet, is it okay to say, does it make sense if I'm wanting to check instead of saying, is that clear? That's fine. 
all in the tone. You can say, does that make sense? If you said, does that make sense? No. Yeah, you can change the tone and sound weird, but does that make sense? Is that clear? Do you have any concerns about that? That's all fine. Cool. All right. Now you understand the theory of that. You need to um, put it into practice. Anish, can I write the proctor's, the interlocutor's name on my role play card so that I won't forget it? Great idea. Great idea. Yes, I, I would go for first name between. That's a good idea. Um, Okie dokie. I think that's all from me. Um, sorry to keep pounding you with um, um, criteria type stuff, but again, at the end of the day, it's about getting the score that you want. Uh, Nyozi, can you teach us more about the linguistic criteria? Well, just briefly, let me bring up the slide again. I mean, this is the stuff that, I mean, I, I can, I can, but it'll be very theoretical. Let's have a look. So the linguistic criteria, intelligibility, just briefly again. So this is the clarity of your speech, your pronunciation, okay? And word stress. Um, fluency, that is the tempo, hesitations, and searching for language, as well as fillers like ah, mm, ah. So you want moderate tempo and not much hesitation and very few fillers if you can. Appropriateness, this is the tone of your voice. This is the politeness of your language. This is also the, um, whether you're, if you're speaking to a patient and you start talking to them about myocardial infarct, for example, that's inappropriate because as a patient, I don't wanna hear all technical jargon. So I'm making it um, understandable, putting in layman's terms for my patient and grammar and expression. That is vocabulary and grammar. Um, I mean, if you're having problems with these, especially A and D, you should go to e2school.com. We have courses on pronunciation. We have a pronunciation course and we have a grammar course. The grammar course is free. The pronunciation course is $9. It's very cheap. Um, we'll take you through all the 44 sounds of English. Um, it's good. Um, okay. Um, Lily George, tell us more about empathy. Um, just quickly, empathy, you can express empathy like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's not very good. I'm sorry to hear that you've been having issues lately with your headaches. That's a better form of empathy, but the best form of empathy is that mixed with attentive listening. Uh-huh, I understand. Okay. Oh, six weeks. Okay, I see. That's better. Phew. During the interview, I said something in grammatically incorrect and then corrected myself. Uh, that's, that's not a bad idea. Gets tough. It's tough, that, especially the grammar. Anyway, thank you. Um, thank you for coming along. Um, if you have any further questions, you might want to think about booking a one-on-one -on -one tutorial or taking a, a speaking intensive. We have these speaking intensives. It's pretty good. I think it's 39 US dollars. You get two one-on-one -on -one sessions with the teacher where you practice a role play and get feedback. Um, that's a good way to do it. Um, cool. Otherwise, if you have any, any more questions, um, feel free to join those live classes and ask your, uh, the teacher in the live class would be happy to, happy to answer them for you. Great. Thanks very much for coming along. I will see you soon.